Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for the My Star Learning Series, the last one of the school year. So we really appreciate, appreciate you being here today. And um, we're going to hear about reading apprenticeship strategies in My Star. And um, we have a really great session with some amazing presenters. So I'm very excited for you all to be here today. Um, first, we're going to hear about how this partnership between reading apprenticeship and My Star came about. Um, and then we'll get an overview of what the reading apprenticeship approach is, and then hear from two MyStar teachers about their experience incorporating reading apprenticeship into two of our MyStar units. Um, we'll have time for questions after we hear uh, about our teachers' experiences. And then if there's time, we've got a short breakout room activity for us to try out reading apprenticeship, maybe with a unit you're currently teaching. It'll give you something to, to use in your classroom still this year. Um, you know, we have Heather Howlett joining us from Reading Apprenticeship. She's returning for another learning series session. We're so grateful for her to be here again today. Uh, she joined us back in November to give us an introduction to text-based inquiry in a science classroom using Reading Apprenticeship strategies. And she's here today to help share the work that our teachers, Nell Balecki and David Bates have been doing to incorporate these reading strategies in MyStar units. So thank you, Nell, David, and Heather for being here today. Uh, my name is Lindsay Watch, and um, I am part of the curriculum development and professional learning teams for MyStar, and I'll be facilitating the session. So if you need any links or have any technical troubles or you know, wanna um, ask a question or anything, um, you feel free to private chat me and um, I'll get you what you need. Make sure you've got all your resources. Um, and Chris Gear is here. She's our professional learning coordinator, so she'll be help running the session as well. Um, and now we're going to hear from Steph Tubman, the coordinator of curriculum development at MyStar. And she's going to share with us um, how this partnership came to be and, and how it's kind of evolved. Absolutely. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so early on in MyStar, it became really clear to us from input from MyStar educators that it was going to be really important to integrate literacy and science text into the program. We consistently heard this even very early on, and we still hear this from the MyStar community all the time. So since then, since that realization, we've been looking out for outstanding frameworks to support the integration of literacy you know, knowing that it has to be a sustained and ongoing part of science class, you know, not just a tack on, um, there has to be sense making of the text and investigation of science itself through the text to complement the hands on investigation that we do in the classroom. So at first to us and to many, this might seem like a tall order, um, but it was my star teachers, Nell Balecki and David Bates who were working with reading apprenticeship to design materials and they saw a tremendous opportunity through their work to enhance my star in a couple units with the RA approach. So in June 2020, they pitched the idea to my star leadership. Um, not everyone in June 2020 was thinking of innovative opportunities or ways to expand or grow, but Nell and David were, which I think is amazing and speaks a lot to them. Um, we strongly agreed that that was a great opportunity and we made an agreement with RA to support Nell and David to integrate the framework into two MyStar units. Um, and we also hope more in the future. Um, and so throughout the challenges of fall 2020 and uh, throughout the year 2021, the work has continued um, with the RA teachers, you know, Nell and David, and then Heather, um, who's here with us today. And we've learned so much from them already about how to bring um, this integration to life in MyStar. And we're just thrilled to host today and to share the initial results with everyone, um, with those who are here. Um, so with that, that's our sort of origin of this work in a nutshell, and I'm going to pass it off to Heather um, to introduce the reading apprenticeship framework. Thank you, Heather, for being here. Sure. Thanks, Steph. Um, hi, everyone. I'm just going to give a quick overview of what reading apprenticeship kind of is about. Um, so you get a little bit more context and kind of a sense for the work that now and David did, um, but the bulk of our time is really kind of hearing their stories about the work that they did uh, with the MyStar units. So I hope that you will find this really, really uh, applicable to your day-to-day -day work. So um, what you're seeing on your screen right there is a list of some of the capabilities that colleges and careers require our students to have. You know, the first sentence of the next gen science standards appendix M states that literacy skills are critical to building knowledge in science. And we know this to be true. 
And so we need to ask ourselves, are we providing opportunities for our students to do these things on a regular basis? You know, who's doing the work of the learning in the classrooms? We know that the ones doing the reading, thinking, and talking, and writing are the ones doing the learning. So how do we create opportunities for our kids to practice these super, super important skills? Next slide, please. Can you head to the next slide, Lindsay? Oops, I think Thank I am you. showing. Are you able to see? I I've got a lag, so I apologize. I think uh, the rain is affecting my internet, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm All right, great. we're good. So this is the Reading Apprenticeship Framework, and this really kind of encapsulates um, our instructional approach. Reading Apprenticeship is really has been designed for all the content areas. Um, we're going to talk specifically about its application to science right now, but you know, it describes the relationships between the teacher, the student, the texts, the tasks that students engage in um, to become more skillful and confident participants in their literacy and their learning. And there's a relationship of trust between the accomplished practitioner, which is the teacher, and the novice learners, which are our students. So that's where the apprenticeship comes in. It's a partnership of expertise drawing on what teachers know and do as discipline-based readers and on our students' unique and often under, underestimated strengths. Um, the curriculum kind of expands to how we read and why we read in the ways that we do, as well as what we're reading and what we're making sense of. All right, next slide, please. I think the leg got you again. <laughs> there, okay. The focus on text is central um, as a resource for inquiry. So, you know, we inquire into discrepant events and hands on activities, but text can serve as a resource for inquiry as well. So, linking back to our question slide, you know, what counts as text in science? Really, most everything that we look at and try to make sense of. So, you know, the idea from NGSS is that reading in science requires an appre appreciation of the norms and conventions of the discipline, the nature of evidence that's used, attention to precision and detail. It goes on to say that they have to be able to gain knowledge from elaborate diagrams and data that convey information, things that illustrate the scientific concepts. You know, we know as science teachers that we have to read and make sense of a lot of different types of things. So what counts as text in science is a lot. <laughs> Next slide. But when we're using text as resources for inquiry, we have to think about tools and scaffolds. We cannot expect our students to just know what to do when we put a text in front of them. So on the slide, you're seeing some examples um, of some scaffolds. Nell and David are gonna share more, um, ones that they've tried using specifically within the MyStar units. Um, and it's really important because the most powerful support is the teacher mediation using text as resources for inquiry takes expertise there's a lot of teacher decisions to be made based on knowing their students and their students development you know the teacher is deciding which text what parts of the text are they going to read kind of frames the task um, so i'm really excited that we're going to dig into hear more about how nell and david did that within the my star units all right, let's head to the next slide. So without further ado, um, I'm going to be having what we call a fireside chat with Nell and David. And so I'm gonna be asking a question. Um, we'll start with Nell and then go to David for this first round. And then, um, you know, as they share kind of their responses and examples of what they did, 
Um, then I'll ask another question and then we'll go to David first and then Nell. But you're going to see and hear a lot of specific things around how they brought text into these MyStar units. So thank you, Nell and David. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, what are you noticing about students' understanding of concepts as you've incorporated more text and supports? What, how has doing this helped? Um, well, I guess I'll start off. Thank you, Heather. Um, I definitely have noticed that my students have a deeper understanding of the science of the storyline um, of the content that we're trying to develop. Um, I see them digging deeper into the text. I see them making uh, more significant connections, um, connections that are meaningful and that are real. And so when they are writing a summary or they're doing text annotations, they're moving beyond just very one word, simplistic um, surface level answers like I agree or wow, or that's cool or I like that to actually trying to connect uh, some of their experiences with, uh, you know, the science that we are, um, you know, working through as we progress through the MyStar storyline. So I think it has definitely helped and definitely improved their level of understanding um, as, a, as a future scientist, if you will. David, what about you? Oh, you're muted, David. There we go. Sorry about that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nell. Thanks, Heather. I think one of the things that is a consideration for me as I dove into this is recognizing that um, almost all my students I would characterize as reluctant readers and writers. 98% uh, of the students that I work with are, are of Middle Eastern descent, and many of them are only uh, second generation. Um, kids that are here, they speak Arabic at home, and the only place that they use English is at school. And so, you know, they, and again, at, at middle school and eighth grade, you know, they're suddenly now, it matters to them what their peers think and so forth. So we have some challenges going into it. And I needed to provide the structures, put things in place for them to, uh, that safety, that, that social aspect was really, really important to build structures that all of them could engage in comfortably um, without feeling like they were um, not capable, try and build up their esteem, build up their confidence level. And the RA strategies really structure things in a way that, you know, you can say to kids, well, here, we're gonna work through this together. Um, and then also build the scaffolds in place without making them feel like they're somehow uh, not capable. Um, so they need the practice with the reading and the writing. Um, and I'm trying to set them up for success. And I found that the RA strategies really help them do that. And as a result of that, you know, I look at what my students do. I find that they're able to write better. They're able to include more details in their writing. Uh, and when they come to the application phase, as they do at the end, when, the, when they check your understanding, more of the students are able to provide more details and, and demonstrate better understanding of those ideas as they're able to work through those problems. Thank you. So as you kind of set to this work, um, what did you think about as you were choosing text and, and which routines to use with the text? You know, what factors did you take into account? How did you decide where to put the text within the units? Let's start with David and then we'll go to Nell. So thanks, Heather. Um, so my approach, and, and again, you know, even um, though I consider myself having some experience, every time I do this, I still feel like a brand new teacher. Uh, but basically, for me, I started with the unit and I printed out on a piece of paper and I have to look, look through the whole thing. And I'm looking to see all of the different components that are already included. And I have to remind myself to think of each different component as a piece of text, uh, the graphs, the images, and the things and, and every little detail, including the things that are already written there. Um, and what I do is I actually kind of made a worksheet that I can, can share if we want to, but um, so matter of fact, yeah, let me go ahead and let's see if I, no, let's see, there we go. All right, so if that's showing, is that, Let 
I'm not sure if this is going to pop up or not, but we'll see what. All right, you guys seen the RA strategy survey table? All right, so I basically just kind of made a, a list where I listed RA strategies down it, put some notes for myself in the middle as to um, what those strategies were, because there's a lot of them to work with. Um, and then on the right side, best application. So then I began to look for things in the unit um, that would go ahead and align with um, what was going on. All right. Um, so basically, I went through the unit and looked for that. And then um, I go take a second look at it and look for places where I think the kids might stumble, uh, not have the background, have some difficulty um, getting into it, and decide if I need to provide some kind of supplemental material uh, to go with that. And at that point, then I start looking for outside resources that I can bring in. Um, found good success finding some things on CK-12. Also, not all of my kids are struggling. Some have been here several generations. And so sometimes I need something that will supplement for kids that are moving ahead easily. So give me time to work with the other kids. And so then I can pull in some of those things. Um, also, I've had good luck finding good resources on, on ZME Science um, and Science News for Students and the S Smithsonian Institute. And some of that is pretty challenging reading, but that's not all bad. And even using with kids that are struggling readers, you know, self-esteem is an issue. So putting something that's challenging in front of them can help them feel like um, build their self-esteem as long as we don't put them in a position of embarrassing. But, you know, if you go to something like, okay, you know, let's find a question that we have here, or find a word that we don't recognize, especially if you put something out, all of the kids can find a word they don't recognize and, and give, give us a point or question to ask. So that's kind of my approach as I dig into it. Thanks, David. Go ahead now. Um, yeah, you know, uh, when I um, when I open a unit and I look to, um, you know, some of those first lessons, I do something similar to what David does. You know, I really try to process on the front end for myself, like what are the students um, being asked to understand? You know, where's our storyline headed and what kinds of activities are incorporated um, in the lesson to get them to that end goal? And then I try to figure out places where I can incorporate that reading or a reading strategy that will help support their understanding of whatever it is that we're working on. So um, my process, you know, I try to break it down into like beginning, middle and end. And so in the beginning of a unit, you know, I might choose strategies that are very low risk for my students, um, strategies that, you know, I, where I'm trying to acknowledge their prior knowledge or activate system schema. I want to know where they're coming from um, in a very low risk environment. So I might do like a cartoon an annotation or something that um, is relatively safe. And that's building on that social dimension within reading apprenticeship where we don't want to put students in a position where they feel um you know like they're going to be embarrassed or they're going to feel like they're called out like we're you know we're in this together this, on this learning journey um in the middle of the unit after we may go through like an uncover phase or um you know a share phase after a circle meeting for example um i might dig deeper into like a 25 word summary or a text in the middle and um you know my intent in doing that is to have students to check in on the students like where are they? Are we all on the same page? And I can usually tell pretty quickly, or, you know, you as the educator, you, you should be able to tell pretty quickly whether or not the students are in line with, you know, where we are moving on this, um, within this storyline. And then toward the end of the unit, I try to give them some sort of a text annotation or a metacognitive log, something that requires um, a little bit, it's, it's a little more higher cognitive demand. Um, it requires a little bit um, more, uh, it requires you to think deeper um, into some of our shared experiences. And I'm looking specifically for connections, uh, for things that they've done, things that now they can relate to their own experience, um, just to kind of strengthen um, that understanding. And all the while, you know, as I'm deciding this, I'm trying to develop a sort of living document, you know, of RA strategies. And I'm trying to support their students because not everyone is coming with the same strategies, the same reading ability, the same likeness for reading. And I want them to 
walk away with strategies that work for them. So, you know, we have an entire scaffold of strategies to use. You don't have to use all of them, but my expectation is that as we work together through these disciplinary liter literacy practices, um, you come away with, you know, a handful that work for you as a student that you can apply, you know, across any content area or any discipline. So that's kind of my um, approach, you know, uh, you know, to where I'm going to put a, a text. And very rarely do I put a text in just to put a text in. And I don't, and there is value in reading. or I'm asking my students to push their thinking forward, there's always going to be a reading apprenticeship strategy um, or a tool attached to that, um, you know, to help those students and guide them, um, you know, in their, in their understanding. Heather, would it be- So you started- to see, I'm sorry, would it be- Oh yeah. An example, would, or maybe we can wait on those. What would you like to do? No, I think let's let's have you share your screen if you've okay. got some examples. I think everyone would love to see that. And I, okay. I just want to, as sure. you're pulling that up now, you know, okay. you're talking about how you scaffold the strategies and the text over time, yes. starting with something that's a lower risk, a little like easier entry point for right. everyone, right? So mm -hmm. kind of right. starting with something everyone can play, <laughs> yes. but we're yes. gonna up the ante and expectation over time, but still supporting it. So like David right. said, ultimately, kind of stretching kids to something that's a little tough, but we're in this supportive environment and we worked our way up to that. So yeah, talk through kind of that. And I know you have perfect examples of that. Yeah, so um, one of the one of the things that I do start a, a particular lesson out or like a brand new unit, um, this came from 7.1, um, the, uh, the beta version, uh, we kind of uh, drew on this cartoon. And this was someone's um, annotations and certainly, you know, um, this strategy was modeled uh, before I let the students do it on their own. Um, it wasn't just kind of handed to them and say, hey, you've got 15 minutes, you know, do this. Um, I actually modeled it for them. And then I asked them to continue the work um, on their own. And it took about 10 minutes or so. And you'll notice that, um, you know, it, it's very uh, low risk. It, um, you know, everyone has seen a bike or has ridden a bike. They're familiar with electricity. Maybe they play video games. And so I just wanted to activate like their, their prior knowledge. I wanted to know where are they coming from, um, you know, and maybe even try to um, make some inferences. You know, what is this woman doing? Why does she look exhausted? Is she working out? Um, I, you know, you'll notice at the bottom, uh, this particular student identified that that's a quote. She's connecting that to her home, that their energy bill is high. Um, you know, they look like they're watching the lady. Maybe they're monitoring whatever she's doing. Uh, she looks exhausting. You know, they're wondering why the wire is there. So very low risk, low cognitive demand, just something that we all can experience together. And after um, this annotation was done, um, I did ask the students uh, to go up to the box above. And you'll notice that I have listed, you know, just a just a small list of um, annotation strategies that I wanted them to use. And when they were finished with their annotations, I wanted them to go back and actually mark the box of what strategy, you know, they used for this particular annotation. Um, at the end, or that's what I just explained. And, you know, I, I tell the students at the very beginning that, you know, my expectation is not for you to, you know, check every single box right away. If all you can do is ask questions, then that's what you do. And you do it to the best of your ability. And then the next time we do it, you know, you might want to add another strategy, um, you know, to your toolbox, but we, we would share this out, um, you know, uh, after we do this, get a feel for where we're headed unit. Um, yep, and, and having worked with Nell, and as I, as I mentioned in a previous conversation, but you know, I wish I was a student in her classroom, right? Um, but again, you know, low risk, give everybody an opportunity um, to participate in some capacity and have success. And by giving everybody a chance, and then you also give them a target. So um, as they do one part this time, then try, next time you're trying to get them to expand it and just build on build on what they're doing and just constantly trying to build and build and build. Can you tell us a little bit about the metacognitive conversations that students have about their reading and sense making processes and how you, what you do to help make students thinking visible, kind of get it out there so you can talk about the process as well as the content. Yep. And 
so for me, this is again one of the one of the strongest areas for RA, and at the same time, one of the most challenging. And particularly, and I don't get, I say particularly with my students, but maybe some other teachers want to jump in, and maybe it's not unique to my students. Um, they really, because of the language barrier, I blame it on the language barrier. Their confidence level about their ability to communicate their thinking is tends to be pretty low, even, and they don't tend to value their own thinking. And so, you know, and the only way you can help them begin to value their own thinking is to get them to share their thinking. And so that you can help them see that their thinking has value and it's something to work on. And so in terms of the approach on that, I'm uh, modeling trained. And so one of my go-tos, you know, is a, is a whiteboard. And the whiteboard is a great tool for getting kids to um, put down their thinking because it's, it doesn't have a permanence to them. For them, they can see that they can put something down and change it and erase it. And then, and then do it again and they can make changes over and over. And what's more is then when you get to that part of the process where they're um, making their, their thinking public by sharing it with other members of the group, they get to see that, okay, my thinking isn't, isn't so crazy, um, but it is, it's a, it's a, it's a hurdle to, to build that confidence so that they're willing to put their thinking down and it takes, takes time. It doesn't happen, simply doesn't happen right away. Um, so anyways, kind of recapping, go back. So the, one of the go-tos is to have the kids put their thinking down in some form on a whiteboard and we be very flexible about what that constitutes. It doesn't have to be writing. It can be an image, it can be a diagram, it can be um, you know, any other kind of format. And if they want, it can be a list, it can be a bullet list. Um, however, they can get their thinking down. And then we start to build the opportunity for feedback between the groups. Um, so there are various ways to do that. One is just a gallery walk. Um, there's different kinds of gallery walks and probably repeating stuff that most people are already familiar with, um, but just so that we have a common place to discuss it. Um, one gallery walk would have uh, the students moving in groups, but leaving a person with their board to be an expert to answer questions about it. And in that case, we, we then you know, prep the kids with um, this is the person who's the expert is not there to tell you what's on their board. They're there to answer questions about your board. Your job is to look at the thinking that's on the board and ask them questions about it. Um, another way to do it that takes the expert out of there if they're having difficulty um, getting the routine there is a post-it note um, where they go from the group, kids still travel as a group from board to board. They look at each board and on each board they ask a question on the note. Um, sometimes they ask a question and write a second note that is something that they um, were able to understand or relate to or that helped them understand the thinking of the concept. Um, and then they do that. Another way is um, um, to have them walk around, look at the boards and collect a note on their own where they get to record privately um, two similarities and a difference. And then after everybody's had a chance to go look at the boards and write down for each group, two similarities and a difference, or you do two differences and a similarity, um, then we can get back together again and students can begin to share what they saw as similarities, what they saw as differences, and then that can lead into a quality discussion about the model that we happen to be working on or the thinking that we're seeing. Um, one of the things that, uh, another prompt that I like if we're having a group conversation, so sometimes we get our thinking out and then get the conversation going, is asking students to begin with, um, I think, you think. And it, and it ends up almost being um, game-like to them as they are trying to guess. But in order for a student to ask a group or say to a group, I think, you think, with an explanation, you know that that student has gone through that metacognitive process of their own where they've had to look at something, figure out what it means, and put it into the context of whatever it is we happen to be learning about so that they can then come back with, okay, I think, you think that... Um, they, they slow down when they get into um, sand or something like that. Um, I also do things like find an idea on another group's board that is similar to your thinking. So again, in order to be able to find those similarities, they have to have sort of had that conversation with themselves about what did I do? What is it that I think um, in order to be able to identify that and then make it public and then find an idea on another group's board that is different from your thinking. Um, so 
again, one of the things, and I just think this warrants importance, one of the things that I absolutely never, never do is, um, is tell us about what's on your own board. You know, to me, the kids have already, they know what's on their own board. They don't need to tell everybody. It ends up being too much of a, of a dog and pony show, and the kids are then competing for who can have the be best decorations as opposed to focused on getting their thinking down on the board. So true, David. And I, I do want to say that, you know, you're honoring student thinking by basically having what they put on the board count as text, right? And you're having them inquire into each other's student generated, self generated texts, which really, if you think about it, that's how all the scientists work, right? They're going to put ideas down and then they're going to give each other feedback and then go to the next step. So I think that that, that is an important point to make. And I appreciate that you shared explicit examples for ways to structure that sharing in a safe way, gets kids kind of used to giving and receiving feedback because that in and of itself, a lot of times takes a lot of practice and scaffolding too. All right, Nell, I see you're back. Let's I hear from you again. So sorry. Okay. No problem. Um, should I share my screen here? Okay, so we talked about um, this particular annotation. I was going through this text in the middle. Um, as I was saying that, you know, you really are able to see um, and get a sneak peek of student to summarize or write the gist um, in their own words and add a picture. Um, so you can definitely see if they're just trying to kind of skate through and skate by, or if they're really truly um, interacting and engaging with the text, trying to um, make sense of, um, uh, of what they've seen or what they've done. Um, so these two strategies are ones that I kind of use like in the, in the middle um, of a particular lesson or a unit. Um, this one, I'm sorry, let me do, uh, let me see. Um, this one was another annotation, um, another uh, diagram here where we were trying to activate um, a schema uh, for a generator for 7.1. And what I wanted to, what I wanted to share um, was this um, 25 word summary. This is another reading apprenticeship strategy that we've used. And the students were asked to read a particular text, um, look at the diagrams. And from that, they were using a highlighter strategy, uh, three different colors, and they had to identify the six important words, three important phrases, and one important sentence um, from the text to write their summary on. And one of the um, one of the things that we were working on with this particular text was really, um, you know, trying to be brief and really trying to get down to the, the nitty gritty, like what is it that we understand about these electric generators um, based on our experiences. And you'll notice that, you know, they highlighted and they, at the end, they had to write their 25 word summary and we're pretty strict on the 25, like they can go 24, 23, you know, maybe we can make an exception for 26 or 27, but we really are trying to kind of hone in on what is the most important information that we want to um, glean from this text. So um, I, I, I did not expect them to understand everything that they read in this text. Some of it is beyond the scope of the unit. However, I think that it is okay to present students another opportunity to work through their toolbox to say what's important, what's not, what can I skip, what do I really need to hone in on? For the end of a unit, um, you know, when I'm, or the end of a, a lesson, um, I just was um, further on in the unit, and what we asked the students to write the gist of the text, what the author said, um, we really wanted their own. Uh, it says, I say, and, and they had to use the prompt of the reading or to dig a little bit deeper. So using prompts, I wonder about, this reminds me is, uh, so the cause is like, and what I'm looking really for are connections to, uh, they've investigated themselves um, to make sense of those ideas. I wonder how, um, definitely stress, definitely um, stressing the authenticity of the, the right um, for the prompt. So I don't want things like, this is like our discussion, or I wonder why this is important, or I can, you know, some of those like superficial frivolous things that really, I know they're not reading. Um, and that's what I stress is the authenticity, uh, you know, with which you complete this work. 
Um, so that is that was an ML. And then one of the other strategies uh, was just text annotations where um, students here, now you'll notice like with the uh, cartoon annotations or with the 25 word summary, uh, not all the strategies are listed for every routine. Um, for the text annotations, they usually are. And students are asked to use a variety of these annotations. Um, in September, like I had mentioned before, you know, if they use one strategy, I'm okay with that. Mid-year, you should be using two to three, but by the end of the year, I'm expecting you to really kind of hone in on that toolbox and those strategies that um, really are working well for you. And you know, you'll notice some students love to draw their um, images in the margins, and that's how they annotate. That's fantastic. Other kids want to summarize or paraphrase, and other kids, you know, want to circle confusing words. And so we really try to hone in on the scientific literacy and say, listen, you know, you've got this, but you have to uh, work through these strategies. So you'll notice these are um, some student annotations. Different students use different strategies, the ones that are their strengths. Um, when they annotate, if they circle, if they underline, they have to have an annotation right next to it. That's something that we talk about um, when we do authentic reading and writing. Um, you know, we, we never just underline or highlight for the sake of underlining or highlighting. Um, you know, you need to apply, it means to look at. Um, and, and so we do, you know, they have all these strategies that are, you know, at their disposal, but they really have to practice um, getting good at the ones that work for them. So these are some examples. And then usually after a, uh, a text annotation, they'll see a chart like this where they have to um, identify the particular strategy that they used and then how it helped to their understanding specifically. So, you know, they highlighted a golden line, they, re they reread the text, um, et cetera. Here's one. I asked questions. And I think, you know, one of my uh, big takeaways is that, you know, with reading, um, I want to put students in the driver's seat, right? And I want these um, strategies to be high cognitive demand on them. And the students should be doing the heavy lifting. And I'm there as a scaffold, I'm there as a support, I'm there as a facilitator, but I definitely want them to feel confident in their reading abilities and being able to get better at reading. So um, I, I think those are the examples that I have, Heather. Um, so yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to, um, I do have a couple more kind of big picture questions, but I want to go to a couple that are in chat. So Wanda sure. asked about the use of think alouds. And so David responded in the chat, but also wanting to hear from both of you, just, you know, how you use think alouds in addition to some of these uh, more written or structured, like on paper pieces particularly how you use it for modeling, I think, or even how you ask students to engage with think alouds. Uh, well, use like within a part with when using a text, you mean like modeling the actual text? Yeah. Um, usually, like if I were to do, um, for example, like if I were to do um, a think aloud with this particular text, um, I would project this on the front board and I would read it out loud and I would absolutely be kind of like, uh, making annotations as I went, and I would read the first paragraph out loud, and then I would ask the students, knowing that they have this, like, what things did you notice that I was doing, you know, as a, as a science teacher, as I read, and, you know, how do you think that helped, or what questions do you have for me, so I would um, do the think aloud with them with a portion of the text before unleashing them, uh, you know, to do it and continue on their own. David, did you want to add to that? You're muted. Yeah, so I mean, similarly, uh, this is, I, I don't, um, only rarely if I have a, a student who's particularly confident would I ask a student to do it in front of the rest of the class, but I use it regularly and I'm trying to model what I want the students to do. And it, you know, I always find it a little bit challenging because you don't want to give, you don't want to give it away. And what's more is, I mean, for me, I don't want the students copying my thinking. I want them to value their own thinking. Um, so I try to be a little bit careful about how much I do and how I use it. 
Um, but yeah, certainly they need to also see sometimes, you know, here's here's my thinking and and you know this is how I record it. Yeah, and sometimes yeah, to that's... piggyback off of what David. Oh, go ahead now. Sorry. that you know that whole idea of like copying what the teacher wrote right you have to be very cognizant of that because that's what they'll want to do is they'll write all of my annotations and then they won't want to do their own and so sometimes I'll even put a text up on the board that has nothing to do with our particular unit but just to model the strategy so they understand the expectation that this isn't just for fun this isn't just a, a sit and get this isn't just to keep you busy like this is a strategy and I expect your best work and so you know copying my annotations isn't going to work if you want to copy one you know we can make it work but not you know being very cognizant of that is very important yeah I think the pitfall um, sometimes is that think aloud could turn teacher think aloud can turn into a disguised lecture and that's not the goal the goal is to really show how you, the, the kinds of moves you make in your head as you're trying to read and make sense of something. So yes, you're reading it, but you're also saying and writing down what you're doing to make sense of it. That's how we're making that invisible stuff going on in our head, visible to kids and apprenticing them to the ways that we read and make sense in science. So that's, that's a key part, but it has to stay brief and then turn it over to kids so they get the opportunity to practice because they're never going to get better if they don't practice authentically, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, I want to circle back to a question that Mary asked, and she said, can Nell and David talk a bit about the content and tasks and goals in their unit? So a little bit maybe thinking about, you know, the particular units you guys both worked in. Um, some of the, the tasks and goals and how then bringing in supplemental texts supported that. So let's go to David first. Um, <laughs> so the, the unit that I worked on um, was the, the 8.1 and it was the bed bugs unit. I know what was the unit and what did the, what, what you know, what's often hard for the kids and then how the texts help or these activities help? Sorry. Um, yeah, you know what, uh, the unit that I worked on uh, was 7.1, which was generating um, electricity. And it's a very um, heavy unit on energy storage and transfer. So I really knew, like, I really, when I looked through the unit, I really picked apart like that storyline, right? And so I needed to make sure that I understood like how they were developing this idea of generating electricity, and then how that concept related to energy storage and transfer. And I also use modeling instruction in my classroom. So I know David spoke about that um, briefly. And so I have a very particular way of developing um, an understanding of energy. And so when, as I look through the unit, you know, I, I knew that we first had to uh, show potential energy was showing it to self, showing itself to us in some fashion, and the students had to name that. So when they saw that change occur in the system, they knew that it was GPE. Then we had to discover the kinetic energy um, account, and you know through our uh, various shared experiences. And once they had a solid understanding of that, then I said, okay, you know energy can then be transferred, right, within um, different accounts, or it can be transformed within a different accounts from GPE to kinetic to electrical, et cetera. And then like the, you know, the biggest sort of hurdle is that energy can be transferred then in an, into and out of a system, depending if the system is open or closed. And that might be where we loop around back to the electricity um, generation. But within that scaffold or within those two lessons in MyStar, I knew that I had to provide a text to solidify their understanding that backed up what they experienced in the classroom. And so had I given them, you know, like that metacognitive log at the beginning of the lesson or the beginning of the unit, it would have just been, I think it would have just fallen flat. It would have fallen through the cracks because they not only would have no understanding of the science, um, the science uh, words that 
they're being asked to apply, but they would have no background information on how this energy account presents itself to us. And so in that particular moment, I was like, all right, I'm going to do an ML because I know that that reading selection uh, that happened to be from my star that was provided would be a fantastic piggyback to what we had already done, the work that we had already um, completed in the class. But where that goes really depends on the storyline and where they are in their understanding of the content. And oftentimes when I get into the nitty gritty of the reading, it's not until they've actually had a shared experience or they've had multiple experiences to draw on that they can connect to, um, to strengthen their understanding of that reading. Is that kind of what you were hoping for, Mary? Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot. So it, it how is. long was all that? How many was this over? This well, obviously wasn't a week. This was a semester. This was a <laughs> Well, I mean, I will I will tell you and anyone who, who works with me knows that, you know, I am always behind. But for me, the work that the students are doing is validated by some of these literacy routines and some of the other instructional uh, methods that I use. But that being said, um, I think, you know, one of my biggest takeaways or something I would encourage anyone to do when they're looking through these MyStar lessons is that the reading has to be authentic and it has to match the experiences that they have in the classroom. And so, you know, I have students who try to get away with the, oh, wow, cool, agree, that's great. And they haven't read any part of the text, right? And so every time I present them with a text, they know that it's an authentic reading that we're doing in class that... I expect their best work and I expect connections, you know, to things that we've done. It's not just something that is handed over and be like, well, I'll turn it in tomorrow because that never works for me. So it does take a while. I mean, it does take a while. I don't, I don't hand things out for homework um, that are reading based. We do that work together in class. But of course, that's teacher discretion. You know, that's just me. Um, I feel much more comfortable doing it now at the end of the year if I needed to than at the beginning. But I still prefer to do that work in class. Um, my, yep, okay. Um, the unit I did um, had to do with, um, uh, what am I trying to get at? Changes and uh, adaptation. Um, it was about it begins with this idea about this problem with bed bugs and shows how bed bugs are a good model for understanding about how adaptation happens over many, many generations. And one of the things that I found that my kids um, have a, a persistent misconception is that adaptation happens um, just like overnight for a whole population. So it's like a group of bed bugs got up one morning and decided we don't want to die from the insecticide and they adapted by changing themselves so that they couldn't, they have the real trouble understanding <laughs> that, no, sometimes large numbers of a population have to die in order for an adaptation to take place. And so one of the things that I went to was a, a in, in lesson two was a Smithsonian article um, that showed species that actually were not able to adapt and as a result went extinct. And so we use that as a model to help kids understand that adaptation is something that does happen, um, but sometimes it doesn't happen fast enough. And if it doesn't happen fast enough, then a species ends up actually going extinct as a way to add some context and framework for understanding that adaptation is, is necessary for survival. And the definition of adaptation is that a species is able to, or changes happen genetically over time that allow that species to survive. Excellent, that's really helpful context. Thank you, thank you both. And actually, I wanted to add um, one more thing too. I know that, you know, um, many of the examples, uh, you know, that David and I are talking about, you know, the, the students uh, are using these literacy practices after their shared experiences, right? Um, because we want that authentic reading. However, um, I wouldn't shy away from giving students a text that is more challenging or a text that they may not understand completely 
um, at the beginning of a lesson or a beginning of a unit. It's just the literacy strategy that I would use would be different. So we might do a roadblock words lesson uh, with that particular text, or we might do um, a questioning strategy with that particular text. So they can go in different parts of the lesson, but even if they're more difficult, it doesn't mean um, you know that you can't use them. You would just use a different technique or a different strategy, one that you know might start to get them thinking or questioning, knowing that, you know, the answer is to come. Yeah, good point. And I think you guys both made really important points about how the reading happens in class and that it's supported with the strategies, but also the conversations, right? So the annotation is in preparation for conversation, right? That the talk, through the process is what really helps kids like kind of, well, dispel misconceptions. As David said, we know in science, lots of misconceptions come. So how do we, ignoring them does not make them go away. How do we wrestle with them and lay them down and say, no, that's not right. Instead, here's the correct concept. Through inquiry into text, through shared experiences and talk about, here's what I thought, but now I think because of what I read, because of what I saw, and making those really explicit, right, and having kids say that to each other, not just from the teacher, but having, hearing it from peers, so powerful, it's a game changer, mm -hmm. um, and just wanting to kind of come big picture then, just thinking about how you two are learning about incorporating more literacy into science, and some of those disciplinary literacy uh, pieces that are emerging like what are you learning as practitioners yourself as you've went through this work of bringing in more texts and whoever wants to go first is fine I forgot whose turn it is <laughs> that's okay you know if, if I'll jump in on this one um it's amazing to me you know how much I learn about my students and the roadblocks that they're they're facing trying to get from point a to point b you know as a this I was looking for an opportunity to bring this in, so I was going to bring it in. We had a uh, meeting the, uh, Tuesday of the secondary middle school science teachers in Dearborn, and one of the conversations that got brought up by a teacher is, and this is, so sorry, one of the things that I heard early on about my star from teachers is there wasn't enough text, and I'm confident that that came from a place of there's no textbook, so there's not enough text. Some teachers are very, way too used to assigning kids read page two or something like that, which is not, not a useful skill or habit. But um, so in all the teachers talk about, there's not enough text in my start and there absolutely is. Um, so Tuesday in this middle school science teachers meeting, the, one of the teachers says, there's so much text in these units. I don't know what to do with it. It's just too much. And they were looking for ways. And all of a sudden the conversation is looking for ways to get around utilizing the text that's there. And my heart was breaking. Our kids really, really need that. All the kids need that. These, these opportunities to dive into the information are opportunities to develop understanding and to develop those skills of inquiry and asking questions. That's where, you know, when, when all they can do is focus on the specific content, they sometimes miss those um, scientific uh, practices that are part of NGSS that are just so important. To me, those are the central skills that we ought to be focusing on, on developing. And that comes from giving kids that opportunity to dive into a text, ask questions, ask their peers questions, and you know, talk about their thinking on it. Sorry, I probably went off on a, on a bit of a tangent there, but I'll stop talking. No worries. <laughs> no worries. Go ahead, go. You know what, I think for me, um, I never considered my Um, I think it has strengthened, you know, my uh, pedagogy uh, tenfold. And I think it has, um, I've seen some great gains and some benefits from my students. And so for me, using text in class um, is not something that I shy away from. And I definitely think that, um, you know, students need to, uh, 
you know, be familiar with charts and graphs and data tables and, you know, all of those things, cartoons and images and video clips, all of that can provide evidence to help strengthen, you know, our understanding of what's going on um, in that particular lesson. So, uh, you know, I can only speak for myself, but it definitely um, is part of my routine. It's part of what I do uh, with my students. And um, I'm not so sure how happy they are about it, but we definitely, uh, we definitely make it work. So nothing but nothing but positive things to say. Um, I think there's a lot of growth that comes out of it. You know, I can, in my own personal growth uh, through the RA program, when I, before I did that, um, I always looked at text and said, oh God, my students are yeah. gonna hate reading this. They're gonna really, um, you know, and I looked for, I was also, I looked for ways around using text. And for instance, I would figure, is there a video that I can come up with that communicates the same idea as the text? And then, you know, then after it was like, oh, wait a minute, the video is a text. And just showing a video doesn't do any more good than, frankly, having them try and pretend to read a text that they don't really understand. It's not about whether it's a written text. It's not about whether it's a video. It's about how you approach the material that's in it and how you get kids to look at it, talk about it, ask questions so that they begin to internalize, this is what I understand about it. This is the questions that I have about it. This is what it's trying to communicate with me. And now this is what I understand because I took the time to dive into and work with it. And you know what too, David, I wanted to piggyback off of what you just said, which I think is super important is that um, all of these different uh, strategies and tools work for different students. And so just because you see it mathematically or graphically, that might work great, you know, for a handful of kids, but other kids want to see the text. And then another kid wants to see the video clip. Another kid wants to see, um, you know, an image or a drawing of it. And so I think it allows entry, um, you know, for all learning modalities, like everyone can kind of come in and say, you know, I, I don't gravitate toward the table, but I, I like seeing it, you know, in a diagram. And so being able to represent the information multiple ways so that students, you know, have that entry point, I think is super, super valid. And also, I think, too, if you use these strategies, I think one of the wonderful things about read, or, um, reading apprenticeship is that, you know, if all you do is present kids with like a text annotation, they're going to get bored of that really quickly, right? And then it's just going to be one more thing that they don't want to do. But, you know, we have some of the templates. I think Lindsay has them. You know, you do a golden line one day. You do video clip notes the next day. You do a text annotation. You do a cartoon annotation. You do a 25-word summary. You do an ML. There's so many different varieties that they're always reading, but it's not in the same form every single time. And I think that's kind of what keeps them going too, is that they're not always, you know, just doing the text annotations. Beautiful segue now. So um, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Lindsay um, here. When you know we have some tools for you all, um, you know places to look for text, and also some of those templates that David and Nell have shared um, that are useful. So things that they've spoken about. So um, actually, or or Chris, I'm not sure who's who's taking the mic here, but um, getting resources in folks' hands and time to kind of play around with it a little bit. So I'm going to take a minute and um, we'll talk about uh, this slide. Um, and we had intended, if we had a lot of time left, to give you some time to dig around in here in uh, breakout rooms and then kind of report out. But um, we had such good conversation that we didn't um, we didn't want to stop. So um, just so that you know, we did put together some resources here, and um, these are resources that are also linked in the MyStar. Uh, on the da teacher dashboard under resources under that teaching and that teaching resources document. So if you um, can't find your link to these slides, you know we can still find them for you, or or you can find them on your own. But um, some of the some of the um, things that that Nell and David just said just ring so true for me. I also avoided giving my kids text for 25 years. <laughs> um, tried to find my way around it. Um, I hated reading instruction as a student. It was like nails on a chalkboard um, and I just couldn't put my kids through it. And um, when I see Nell's examples and when I listen to Heather and David talk, um, 
I'm like, hey, this sounds amazing. Like kids would like this. This is engaging. There's choice and there's um, individuality. And, and it's, you know, all about how does this affect me and what works for me? And I'm like, this is amazing stuff. So super excited to um, have this little collection here. So text sources, um, MyStar has been adding differentiated reading um, resources, which are not quite the same as what David and Nell are doing. Um, they're really intended to be a little more independent student work, but we've been using science news for students um, for kind of current events uh, type um, text. And then the CK12 online textbook is also a great resource if you're looking for something that's really more of a textbook um, kind of um, content. Uh, and then David mentioned ZME science. We have Kids Fun Science, National Geographic Kids, Easy Science for Kids, um, Smithsonian, David mentioned also. And then um, we do have a lot of teachers who use Newsella. You need um, a, a subscription. I Sometimes it's free. I think if there's a fancier one your district can pay for. Um, but anyway, those are all good sources for text. Excuse me. Um, and also, you know what, Chris, if you don't mind me jumping in real quick, if your district um, already has books uh, purchased, I know in the last few years, a lot of districts have gotten away from buying books. But if you have some of those old books, a lot of them have like a virtual option or like an online book. And I know uh, like Apprentice Hall, the whole series, they had some interactive textbooks. And so it, once your district purchases that, you can use that as well. Um, we've used quite a bit of that information too. It just takes a little more effort because you have to, you know, cut and paste and, you know, put it into the document, but. Thanks, Nell. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea also. Um, uh, and then strategy templates. These are some of the things that Nell showed you um, and uh, we fixed them up so that they're blank. So you're welcome to um, take a look at those and use them and adapt them. Um, I, I'm super excited to have some, some ideas. I, I love the image annotation and text in the middle makes a ton of sense and I, it's just good, good stuff. Um, and then science prompt ideas. This is something, these are some things that um, Heather showed us back in November. So if you are um, coming up with questions for uh, a student interactive uh, experience, she gave us a great list of science and math reading sentence starters and prompts. Um, we have teacher talk stems, which you can adapt to be you know, written prompts. Um, STEM tools has prompts that are specific to different CCCs and different SCPs, lots of choices to kind of um, you know, get you thinking about what you might wanna ask kids um, in terms of content. Uh, there's CCC sentence starters. Uh, and there's that link to that teacher strategies resource document um, that has all kinds of um, great stuff in it. And um, down at the bottom, there's a specific section on um, creating student liter literacy activities that um, lists, again, some of the text sources, some of the prompts. Um, so we have lots and lots of places where we have this stuff um, stored and listed for you, um, including this slide. So um, if you're thinking about this a couple months from now and you can't remember where you saw it or where to find it, you know, shoot me uh, an email and I'd be glad to hook you up. Um, I, I got to say, as a science teacher, that was the scariest part for me was, okay, I'm going to give this text to my kids. I can choose a text. That's all fine and good. But then when I put it in front of them and they say, I don't know what to write. And then it's like, then what? <laughs> Moment of panic, right? Um, so that's where those prompts come in as they're like sentence starters for the kids to kind of just know, hey, borrow some of these and fill in the, the dots afterward, right? Like they, they'll get you started. But also those teacher talk stems help me know like how to model when I do a think aloud, what do I say, where do I say it? And so those talk stems were support for me as well. And then the student talk stems were support for my students. So I highly recommend. And the whole idea guys is to, to really get the thinking out there don't ask questions that necessarily have a right or wrong answer. If we want to support and encourage thinking, we want to ask questions that elicit thinking. And sometimes stuff's going to come up that is that is a misconception, but then you can deal with it. Then you can talk about it. So just wanting to, again, we're inquiring into text, right? And so wanting kids to dig in and really kind of question it and say, does this mean what I think it means? 
can I trust what this is telling me? That's the kind of thinking that independence that we want to get to, right? So just as you consider some of these prompts and tools, the whole goal is just that inquiry stance. What's here? How am I making sense of it? And I'm going to talk about it with my peers. Just to remind you that um, we do uh, have our training for professional learning facilitators and teacher leaders. These would be um, MISAR teachers or um, curriculum um, leaders who uh, would like to become our certified professional learning facilitators and be able to provide MISAR PL or be a teacher leader where you're going to be a, a building or district um, mentor. Um, and that training is virtual and uh, it starts at the very end of June and runs through July. And there's the link to the sign up for that. Um, if you have new teachers in your district, um, just to be aware that we are going to offer our phase one new teacher training virtually also. Um, we have a session in early August and a session in late August that are available for those teachers to sign themselves up. Um, if they don't have a subscription quite yet and you need to save them a spot, um, send us an email and, and we can manage that. And we will run a session um, in late September also for all of our late hires and late um, people who get switched lately, late, <clears throat> excuse me, at the beginning of the school year. Um, modeling in Michigan, you heard David and Nell both talk about being trained in modeling. Modeling instruction is um, extremely rich and uh, and blends really nicely with our MyStar um, units and philosophies. And so we actually have modeling um, with MyStar uh, events, workshops, and there are stipends. So, um, it, it, you know, you could teach summer school or you could go spend some time with the modeling people and let them- Come and join us. Yes, come and join <laughs> us. It'll be a great time. It'll be a yeah. great time. <laughs> um, so it, just great, enthusiastic, highly skilled, um, wonderful teachers. So uh, um, there's uh, one that starts in June, finishes in July, and then one that starts in July, depending on what grade you're interested in. And there's the links for those. Thanks, Chris. And just to um, share a reminder, we had our learning series session in April to share what's new with a um, renewed MyStar, MyStar subscription for next year. <clears throat> and so we have rolled out um, a handful of enhanced units and we'll be um, beta testing one as well this fall, um, as well as some new off the shelf lessons that we, will be available. And um, <clears throat> we actually have a curriculum enhancements roadmap here. There's a link to it um, on this slide and that gives you um, call outs for um, all the, the enhanced units, um, units that have modeling uh, notes for them if you are trained in that. Uh, uh, units that have remote resources. So that whole table is there and it's a live document. So we do um, update that regularly. Um, so that um, is kind of a one-stop shop for your information. Um, we really, really appreciate you all being here today. Thank you for sticking with us on a late Thursday before Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed um, the hearing from Nell and David. Um, about how they really incorporated these strategies into these MyStar units. Um, there are um, a compilation of past MyStar learning series sessions and resources. There's a link here on the slide. And then I also put a shortcut to the November reading apprenticeship session. So if you want to hear, you know, what uh, Heather initially talked about with us back in November, there's lots of great resources in there kind of going into detail about some of those sentence stems and you know some of those other supports you can use with your students. So it's a really great session. Check out the recording and, and the resources for that as well. Um, if you would please sign out in the chat with one takeaway from today. Uh, we'd love to hear what you thought about the presentation. And um, there is a link to a, a feedback survey if you would, uh, would like to you know, put that, those thoughts in writing. We always appreciate hearing those positive thoughts um, I'll throw that link in the chat as well. It's on the agenda. It's in the slides here. Um, and we really appreciate you being here. And thank you again, Heather, David, and Nell for joining thank us you. and sharing your expertise with us. Thank, thank you. you.